Okay, I'm, 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 I'm keen to have uh, the discussion now about demographic trends, yeah, and I'm really happy uh, to open up uh, with uh, Professor Axel bursch supern yeah, um, who is um, um, the director of the Munich Center for the Economics of Aging at the Max Planck Institute for Social Law and Social Policy. I hope I, I brought the... <laughs> The name fully, yeah, <laughs> and correctly, excellent, I thought so, yeah. Um, we will hear um, a little bit about demographic trends uh, in the Euro area countries and what they imply, among other things, for the economic growth, for employment, and in particular for capital flows. Yeah? And his, discuss, uh, his paper will be discussed uh, by Professor Anna Maria Maida, who is an associate professor at Georgetown uh, University. And uh, like always, after we have the presentation and the discussion, um, we will have a Q&A, and I'm pretty sure it will be as lively as the last uh, one, because there are very interesting, I think, conclusions coming out of your presentation. And you will talk about migration, I heard, which is for sure something what you know, is, is very interesting and very important right now, uh, too. So please, the floor is yours, Axel. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, <clears throat> it's not only an honor, it's also fun to uh, talk in this, uh, uh, in this audience uh, and uh, to celebrate with you the uh, achievements of having the euro for, for two decades. Uh, now, I have the modest talk task uh, of uh, talking about uh, the next four decades uh, of the euro area. Um, and I will do this by uh, focusing on demo demographic uh, changes, a little bit on migration, uh, and uh, quite a bit more on uh, economic growth. Um, so let me start. Uh, um, there will be a lot of slides. Um, <clears throat> what, what, what is population aging? For the next two decades, uh, uh, it is not so much the uh, shrinkage of the population. That will happen in the uh, third and fourth decade from now. It's more a shift of uh, shares uh, of, the, uh, of the different cohorts, age brackets, uh, within a uh, fairly uh, steady population size. Uh, now, if you look, um, that, that, that is best measured as the, what's, what we call the old age dependency ratio. And you see in the uh, upper left-hand corner, uh, this is the number of uh, people 65 and over divided by the uh, number between 20 and, and, uh, and uh, 64. You can change this to, to, to a similar number. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and you see four countries. Uh, so there's obviously uh, Japan, uh, we all know, uh, as the oldest country on top. Uh, and below are the, the, the two uh, front runners in terms of youth, uh, China and, uh, and the U.S., and you see, interestingly, uh, uh, China is now the youngest, uh, but uh, will actually give place to the US. And the Eurozone is in the middle. Uh, and uh, if you look at the orders of magnitude, uh, then uh, uh, they're huge, right? Uh, you, you have about five uh, young people to one old uh, in China right now, and it's two to one uh, in, uh, in Japan. Huge changes uh, in between. Now, the interesting thing, and that is sort of uh, a, f a first message. The Eurozone is so heterogeneous, it almost fills the entire place between China and Japan. Oh. So the heterogeneity of demographics is huge within the Eurozone. Um, right? Now, why is that so? You, you can spend all kinds of uh, details here. I, I tried to, to make the story short. Uh, there are some countries uh, where you had a very sharp transition. Uh, from the baby boom to the baby bust. Uh, that, these are the, uh, apologies, uh, Germanic countries, uh, including the Netherlands, uh, Austria, Switzerland, and also China for a, for a different reason. Uh, Chairman Mao, uh, greeting you, uh, also has very sharp transitions between boom times and boost times. Uh, so that's, that's one group of countries. Another country is more the Mediterranean ones. Uh, for a long time, had uh, low birth rates uh, and high life expectancy. That's why they uh, are, uh, have the largest proportion of, uh, of older people. And then there's some countries like France, uh, Sweden, the Scandinavian countries, and the US, uh, which uh, have uh, an increase in life expectancy, but no 
no decline in fertility, uh, essentially no decline in fertility. So these are three very different patterns, uh, and uh, that explains some of the variety of, um, of uh, uh, demographic trends. Um, now, uh, the, 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 the aim of sort of looking at the next four decades uh, seems crazy uh, given these long time horizons. So uh, one important question is how reliable are actually these, uh, uh, these projections? Uh, and uh, as, you, as you will see, it's, it's quite different from uh, the world in uh, which you are as central bankers. Um, so what, what, what we actually see is that for the next 10, 20 years, uh, the, uh, the bandwidth uh, of different projections is fairly low. Uh, now, this is taking all kinds of combinations between low and high fertility, uh, low and high migration, and so forth. Uh, you take the two extremes, which are at the top and the bottom, uh, and you see they do fan out. But we are now talking, very hard for you probably to read, uh, uh, until 2060, so a long time ago. But if you go for the next, uh, say, 20 years, uh, then uh, uh, it's for sure that the Eurozone will age. This is actually showing the fans for Germany, uh, uh, but for the Eurozone, it's the same. Uh, and the most important message here is uh, uh, it will not be a temporary phenomenon, OK? So even in the best of circumstances, uh, there will be a plateau which we reach about in uh, 35, uh, 2040, uh, but it's not a temporary phenomenon which go away. So any kind of policy which tries to sort of dig a tunnel under the uh, uh, demographic mountain uh, will fail. Uh, the tunnel will never reach the light, uh, either by some grandiose demographic uh, fund, that won't work, uh, or if you try to fund the, uh, the, uh, the pension, the healthcare uh, systems by, uh, by increasing debt and then try to repay it, uh, you won't have the chance actually to repay it. So that's, a, that's another important message uh, to keep in mind. Uh, uh, population change is there to stay, and it will change that world uh, to a world where uh, we have more older people. Now, would migration help? That's my short on only slide on migration. Um, and obviously, it does make a difference. Uh, now, these are, again, for Germany, uh, uh, you, you see three scenarios where you have migration of 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 per year, uh, net uh, uh, in and out. Uh, and you see, it does make a difference. But uh, it makes only a small difference. Now, obviously, if you have huge migration, then uh, you, you can, and these are younger people, uh, who, who migrate in, which uh, is the typical kind of phenomenon, uh, then you can uh, uh, bring the, uh, the uh, old age dependency down. But you have to look at the numbers here. Uh, so to flatten out the, the, the curve, uh, the average for the next 40 years has to be 1.2 million per year. Now that is more than uh, Germany had in 2015. So it's completely out of the question, right? And this is only the average. Because uh, aging is, uh, is, is uh, nonlinear, uh, actually at the peak it would be 2.1 million. So it's out of the question that uh, migration will take care of, uh, uh, of uh, population aging. The other one which is always asked, uh, uh, what about a new baby boom? Uh, so rather than having uh, 1.5 kids, uh, have uh, more than two, uh, like uh, the US had uh, until recently. And uh, again, you don't have to think very long. Uh, uh, well, the, the, if you look at the old age dependency ratio, which divides 65 to 20 to 64, you obviously don't see anything for the next 20 years, right? Even if there were a baby boom right now, it takes 20 years until they enter the labor market. Uh, so it won't help uh, to, to adjust for the, uh, for the increase which we have. And even in the long run, uh, you see the same what, what, we have, uh, what you have seen earlier. Even with the uh, 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 much higher pop, uh, uh, fertility rate, uh, you, you will just lower the plateau uh, but not go back into a uh, young world. Um, so the, the, the issue is uh, uh, the demographic changes will be there, independent more or less of migration and uh, in a future baby boom. So let me move now from, from demographics to, to, to economics. 
uh, uh, and uh, show you the same picture in a different metric, now the share uh, of working age people. Um, and uh, obviously it's the same kind of, uh, uh, of, of figures just upside down. Uh, the, the point um, uh, I want to make here is really economics 101. Uh, what happens in an aging uh, uh, economy, uh, you have, uh, uh, if you look at, um, at GDP per capita, uh, just fewer workers per capita uh, as the main input in an economy. And uh, this will tell you that uh, GDP per capita uh, will, uh, will be under pressure, uh, consumption and everything which you derive from uh, GDP per capita. Um, it's not as straightforward. Uh, so um, what you, uh, what we actually do is uh, adapt a, uh, use a uh, OLG model, uh, which uh, 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 computes uh, GDP per capita, consumption, other macroeconomic uh, uh, aggregates, uh, and look how that will develop uh, when we have fewer and fewer uh, people in working age. Now, the, the, the figures I show you, uh, and that's important, uh, are net of the general productivity trend. Uh, so uh, what you see as a decline is a decline relative to a, now let's assume, exogenous productivity trend. I'll actually talk about productivity later, uh, why this is not completely a stupid uh, 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 assumption uh, that we have exogenous productivity here. Um, now, what you see uh, is uh, this is the decline of uh, labor force per capita, uh, and the point, the first point I want to make is uh, if you look at GDP per capita, it will not decline as much, uh, and why so? Uh, essentially, uh, this, this difference is explained by a change in relative prices. Uh, uh, let me actually jump to the next point. Uh, you will see some increase in wages because there's a lack of young people, so that drives wages up. Uh, relative to that, uh, return to capital, uh, I mean return to productive capital will go down, um, actually more than that, and uh, we'll talk about that later as well. And that, of course, drives endogenously some substitution uh, of uh, labor by capital, uh, robots, whatever uh, you, uh, you, you imagine. And uh, this substitution by, uh, of young people by, by capital will actually uh, 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 generate a, a slower decline of GDP per capita than, uh, than the labor force. So that's the first good news, uh, sort of an endogenous ad adaptation thanks to, to higher capital intensity. Let's actually look at the, uh, at the difference uh, in the growth rates here. Um, if, you, if you translate this over the, the long time, um, this this uh, loss of GDP per capita relative to the exogenous productivity trend is about half a percentage, a little less. Uh, and uh, that is, again, an important number. If we think about productivity changes being in the order of 1.5% one, one or 2%, then this is substantially lower. Now, all the gloom about population aging doesn't mean that GDP is actually going down or consumption possibilities. Uh, it goes down relative to a still growing trend. Now there's still, even if you, uh, if you are modest, uh, think about secular stagnation, uh, uh, there's still some positive growth left. Uh, and I, again, I think that's, that's an important message. Uh, uh, it's relative to, to productivity and there's something left over. But if you look there, 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 there are two more graphs here. Uh, and uh, uh, the first one is uh, um, gross national income, and the second one is consumption. Now, you see gross national uh, income is actually declining much slower than GDP per capita. What is happening here? Now, this OLG model is a multi-country model where you have uh, as uh, symbols for the, uh, for the Eurozone, uh, you have the countries uh, Germany, Italy, and France, uh, and for the rest of the world, I take the U.S. as a simplification. Uh, what happens in a world uh, where uh, the Eurozone ages much quicker than the, uh, and deeper than the United States? Uh, there will be foreign direct investment going actually from Europe to, to the United States. 
where you actually have a uh, uh, higher rate of return as long as the returns equilibrate in this model, very simplistic model. Uh, and then a part of the income in the Eurozone is actually generated outside of the, in, uh, of the Eurozone. So you get a big divergence uh, between uh, gross domestic uh, product uh, and gross national income. And that actually finances consumption for quite a while. So what you see is that uh, international capital flows uh, are positive for quite a while. You see turns around in the 2040s. Uh, then eventually the baby boom uh, uh, will uh, have sort of used those assets uh, uh, which have been invested in, uh, here in the United States, the rest of the world, outside of the Eurozone, uh, repatriates uh, that uh, and then the, uh, the flow will reverse. Uh, and that helps uh, to, to, uh, to, to actually stabilize consumption quite a bit more uh, than even GDP per capita. So there, there are two endogenous, largely endogenous adaptations which will happen. Uh, one is higher capital intensity, uh, and the other one is uh, uh, international capital flows uh, back and forth for some time, right? Uh, eventually, uh, this will also go down. I, uh, I put these circles uh, around 2030, and you see the, uh, the, the differences. Okay. Unfortunately, there's still something left. If you want to keep the growth, not the level, but if you want to keep the growth of uh, GDP per capita or, uh, or consumption as uh, we have been used to, how to fill that triangle? Well, there's no endogenous adaptation here in the model anymore. You actually need policy to do so. Uh, and uh, I think it's pretty much a no-brainer. Uh, these are sort of the typical uh, 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 policies recommended by uh, uh, the Commission, uh, by the OECD, and so forth. Uh, increased retirement age, uh, uh, try to get people earlier into the labor force, uh, increased female labor force participation, everything which sort of helps to, to increase the pool of labor, uh, do something about uh, uh, unemployment. Um, and uh, this is uh, sort of a, uh, <clears throat> a uh, stylized reform. Uh, and the interesting question is, uh, now, these, these are what I would call moderate steps. It's not increasing retirement age from 62 in France to 69. Uh, it's two years. Uh, people also quarrel about this, but uh, uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, and, you, you, uh, and this is done in a, in a, in a time horizon of uh, more than 20 years. So it's a small change in every year. Anyway, so this, the question is, can the modest reforms uh, uh, of this type actually fill that triangle? And the answer is, it depends. Let me first show uh, uh, if uh, we think that labor supply is exogenous. So all these uh, changes uh, imposed by policy will 100% uh, be, uh, be done. And then you see that the, uh, the uh, uh, labor force per capita will still slightly decline. Uh, GDP will slightly decline, but recover in consumption more or less is stabilized. Now, obviously, I choose the parameters uh, to achieve that exactly. But this is exogenous labor supply. Mm -hmm. Now, the next step I do is, uh, uh, from a modeling point of view, fairly complicated. Uh, uh, I endogenous labor supply and allow some substitution between the extensive and the intensive margin of uh, labor supply. So there will be a law change which requires you to work longer, uh, but you're actually uh, able to, uh, for example, within a family between, uh, b between the two uh, 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 parts in a marriage, uh, to redistribute your, your labor supply. Um, and there are other mechanisms. You work less in uh, 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 somewhat less in older age, but somewhat more in younger age. If you allow these kind of substitutions, uh, you get an, quite an astounding uh, result, uh, which is uh, that the re that the reaction is actually fairly big, right? And uh, a lot of the reforms will be undone. I call this backlash effect. You may want to give it a, a similar uh, remark. Uh, but uh, it's not that easy if you have endogenous labor supply to actually force people to move out. Now, this is calibrated to what has happened in the last 10 years in, uh, in the Eurozone. 
Uh, so uh, maybe that effect overestimates what will happen in the future. Uh, but uh, you know all these resistances to, to working longer, uh, and this uh, pretty much undoes uh, the reform effects. Um, okay, so if I take a, a short interim resume, uh, uh, aging takes about one third of the growth in the uh, in the eurozone, but it's still the remainder is still positive. Um, there, there are endogenous forces uh, which uh, sort of accommodate this uh, and make it easier than, uh, uh, than uh, one may think in the, in the first round. Uh, but this will only happen, these automatic uh, adjustments will only happen, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the, in the session today, if we actually allow digitization and uh, higher capital intensity. Uh, many Euroans are against it, and we allow uh, uh, free capital mobility uh, uh, within the Eurozone uh, and uh, out of the Eurozone, which is the big, uh, big one. Um, um, so it's not completely automatic. Um, and uh, it will be one of the, the policy uh, issues uh, we have to think of. Um, moderate structural reform uh, needs and can fill the remaining gap. Uh, but the backlash may be large. Uh, so avoiding backlash uh, will be an important thing. Okay, le let me pick up a point of, uh, which uh, may interest you as central bankers uh, and go back to the uh, decline of the, uh, uh, of the, the uh, not the interest rate, but the uh, r rate of return to productive capital. And uh, most of you have heard of the, uh, the, the asset meltdown hypothesis, uh, which sort of... Uh, uh, it's uh, very blackish uh, in predicting that uh, exactly when uh, the baby boomers need their savings most, uh, it actually will be devaluated. Um, and uh, you do see this, uh, but it's, uh, it's important uh, to, to recognize this depends very much on the openness. This, again, is a simulation, same OLG model, uh, now using only Germany. Uh, uh, you see that the, uh, the decline in re rate of return is substantially lower if, uh, if Germany has a free fac uh, uh, capital flows within the EU, uh, and even less so within the OECD. And if you add uh, sort of global markets, uh, China, India, and the large Asian country, it will be even less. Uh, depends a little bit on, uh, on the pension systems, uh, but these are details uh, I, uh, I don't want to get into. Uh, in any case, what you see is not an asset meltdown, but it is a decline in rates of return. There's no doubt about that uh, rates of uh, return will decline, uh, particularly in, in, uh, in relation to, to, to the wage effects. Um, okay, let, let me change scenery now, now completely and actually go to, 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 to the micro foundations of some of the stuff uh, I'm, I'm doing in the OLG model. Uh, one of the controversial assumptions is that uh, productivity stays exogenous. Uh, now, you could think, actually, that it's not the case because uh, we have more older people. Uh, older people are less productive, as many think, uh, than uh, obviously endogenously there will be another decline in, uh, in productivity, not only because of quantity, but also because uh, uh, TFP will actually decline. Um, now, there is no evidence whatsoever uh, we can find, at least on what I would call shop floor productivity of a normal worker in a standard job. Now that's something special. So uh, uh, there, 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 there are many professions uh, uh, where age may help or age may hurt. Uh, I think in central bank, uh, it's very different from athletes, right? Uh, where you have the peak uh, early or p the peak late. Uh, but in the shop floor, we, uh, we, we, we don't see anything. It's not easy to measure shop floor productivity. That's why we need tons and tons of data. Uh, this is in the automotive sector. We did the same in, uh, in the service sector. Lots and lots of observations. And uh, essentially, it's flat. Uh, and it's made flat by the managers. Uh, because uh, they, they actually assign people in a way uh, that age effects are uh, on, on design, uh, uh, flattened out. Um, and I think that's, again, an important message. Uh, uh, the, the effect is on, on aging, on, on GDP, is essentially a quantitative effect uh, and not so much a productivity effect. I'm looking on the, on the time, so I will jump over this. Uh, and uh, again, an another change of scenery. Uh, what, what, what I have talked about until so far, and uh, that's where my main expertise is, is the real economy. 
But here we are in Zintra, so I also do a little bit on, uh, on uh, uh, the monetary side. Now, aging and inflation. If you look at the, uh, at the literature uh, on the demographic effects on, uh, on inflation and deflation, uh, it's a mess. Uh, you, you get uh, 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 results in any kind of direction, any kind of timing, uh, uh, and uh, we were quite uh, uh, irritated by that. Um, and uh, so what we did is actually we uh, augmented uh, this uh, OLG model uh, by uh, uh, households demand for money, just some very primitive uh, money in the utility. Uh, so you, you, you have a demand for, for cash holdings. Uh, we have a, a central bank with a very simple Taylor rule. Uh, and then we, we sort of push this model through the demographics again. And the main insight uh, in these somewhat complicated uh, graphs is uh, uh, the blue line is inflation. We don't really distinguish between expected and realized. Uh, it's a very simple model. Uh, but uh, the, the main point is we distinguish between two effects which happen. One I call the size effect, and the other one the structure effect. Now the size effect is uh, if eventually populations shrink, demand will decline, aggregate demand. And since supply is somewhat sluggish, uh, you get uh, uh, negative pressures on the inflation. Maybe not deflationary pressures, but definitely uh, dampening inflation. So this is the intuition many people have about Japan, right? Uh, but there's a second effect, which is more subtle and more difficult to understand. This is people, uh, the demographics is not linear. Uh, it actually has the baby boom, baby bust, and the baby boom happens to be in certain stages of the life cycle. And this is different from country to country. Now, there, there are times when the baby boom is still saving. And then there are times when the uh, baby boom will uh, dissave and actually consume much more. And that changes, again, the structure of uh, the pressure on aggregate demand, obviously. Uh, and uh, depending on the country, you get what we call the, uh, the structure effect. And that can either amplify the size effect or work in attenuated, uh, work in the other way. Uh, it's on top of it, and it's usually smaller than the, than the structure effect, uh, but it modifies it quite a bit. And now if you see the two countries which I have drawn here uh, as outcomes, very different. Uh, so in Germany, uh, the, uh, both the structure and the size effect uh, goes downhill and uh, fairly soon crosses this uh, uh, the famous 2% uh, uh, threshold uh, as the uh, upper target of, uh, of the ECB, uh, whereas in France that won't happen. And that, of course, reflects the different kind of uh, dynamics. It's even more so interesting if we look at uh, the United States and China, uh, where uh, uh, you see that uh, U.S. is more like France, uh, where the uh, inflationary pressures are relatively uh, stable over time, whereas in China you see this very quick decline. And you see the, the, the population. That's why I uh, showed you in the very beginning the, uh, the two uh, uh, transitions between uh, population growth and population decline, uh, thanks to Chairman Mao. Uh, and you see them reflected again in the, uh, in the structure effect here. So let, let me finish. My time is over. Uh, and uh, uh, draw a final resume. Uh, 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 while all countries are aging, timing, speed, and extent are very different, uh, even within the uh, Eurozone, uh, not to speak about globally. Um, the negative impact on growth uh, can be dampened by uh, endogenous reaction plus uh, 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 structural reforms. We have seen this before. Um, pro declining productivity, and I jumped over the healthcare, do not prevent reforms uh, such as uh, increasing moderately increasing a retirement age. Uh, uh, you don't see any kind of significant health changes between 65 and 67 on average, stress on average. And the final point is uh, aging induced deflation effects uh, strongly depend on demographic characteristics. Uh, and uh, it's a topic we, we talked a lot about yesterday. Heterogeneity within the Eurozone uh, is uh, widespread and in many dimensions, and demography is uh, yet another uh, dimension of uh, strong heterogeneity. 
which you will have to manage. Uh, and I wish you good luck for that. Uh, and thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and for discussing this excellent paper. Um, in this paper, the authors analyze the macroeconomic implications of population aging on financial, labor, and goods markets. They consider the Eurozone, and they use an overlapping generations model, and they consider three different scenarios. In the first scenario, they keep uh, uh, labor force participation rates uh, constant, exogenous, and they are the current ones. And in this scenario, we do see the population aging has a, a very big negative effect on GDP growth, GMP growth, consumption per capita. In the second scenario, what the authors do is to consider exogenous labor force participation rates, but they set them equal to the rates identified by some labor market policy reforms, for example, increasing the retirement age by two years, reducing the labor market entry age by two years, and importantly, I will go back to this point, increasing women labor force participation and decreasing the unemployment rate. And in this case, what the authors find is that the negative impact of population aging can be mostly undone through these labor market policy reforms. And so what the authors say is that demography is not destiny. We can push back with policy reform. But then, very interestingly, what the authors do is to consider um, endogenous responses of economic agents in the third policy scenario in which labor force participation rates are endogenous. And there, what they show is that this backlash by workers and other economic agents in the economy can, um, for the most part, undo the positive effect of labor market policy reforms. So um, in terms um, of the um, main uh, drivers of population aging, um, the authors analyze four um, fertility rates, current and future ones, um, migration, the uh, baby boom, baby pass transition, and the secular increase in life expectancy. And uh, I was tasked uh, with considering the role, specifically, the migration can play with population aging, in a context with population aging. So I'm going to start by discussing what I learned from the paper in terms of the role of migration. And what I learned is that migration has been able to um, uh, let countries avoid reductions in population sizes. So it was predicted that Germany would um, experience a decrease in population for many years, but that didn't happen. And it was because migration was higher than expected. But, uh, and this is the negative uh, um, message from the paper about migration, we also find from the model that um, even very large migration waves cannot undo the um, uh, size effect of population aging. So the reduction in the labor force, and not even very extremely large migration wave can undo the structural effect of population aging. So overall, not a um, very um, um, positive uh, uh, message about um, uh, the role, the mitigating role of migration in terms of population aging. And what the authors do um, is to show these two charts uh, that Axel showed you just a second ago. I will go back to, to these charts. But on the left-hand side, we have Germany, and also on the right-hand side. But on the left-hand side, what the authors do is to consider different scenarios in terms of fertility rates, uh, mortality, and life expectancy. And they consider each of these drivers um, independent from each other. And um, on the right-hand side, uh, instead, the authors consider different values of migration. And the main point is that when the old age dependency ratio is kept constant is when we have flows of migrants which are politically unfeasible, uh, 1 million and 200,000, as Axel said. 
So my first point uh, um, about this paper and in relation to migration is that my understanding of what the authors um, um, are doing is um, um, to um, consider the impact of migration through different sizes um, and age structures of migrants. Um, but um, truly, migrants affect not only um, age of the current population, but when migrants come in, they also affect the fertility rate. So um, I uh, think that we should not consider these two drivers of population aging independent from each other. Some um, of the effect of increasing fertility rates should be causally assigned to the arrival of migrants. So in some European countries, fertility rates have increased in the last few years, and that has been because migrants have arrived, and they tend to have much higher fertility rates than natives. So let me show you some statistics. They're quite small, but just to... Um, uh, give you some examples. In uh, uh, Belgium, between 2001 and 2005, natives' total fertility rate was 1.5, and the immigrant one was double, it was three. Uh, in Italy, in 2004, um, the uh, natives' total fertility rate was 1.3, basically, and again, uh, it was double for immigrants. So basically, when we go back to this uh, left-hand side chart um, and we look at what the impact would be of higher fertility rate, higher migration, we should really combine um, uh, the effect of migration with some uh, of the effect of a higher fertility rate. And I'm curious what kind of uh, um, uh, numbers you would get by doing so. Um, Next, um, one um, of the uh, big uh, uh, themes in my discussion will be that migration can affect uh, um, uh, the Eurozone uh, um, in a context of population aging through other channels than simply affecting the size of the labor force in different age structures. So let me give you some examples. Um, one is an, uh, a channel that uh, is still related to the labor market. So there is very interesting research in the migration literature that low-skilled immigrants have decreased prices of low-skilled intensive goods and services. This is research, um, uh, for example, for the United States by Patricia Cortes in 2008. And uh, um, some of these low-skilled intensive uh, goods and services are household-related services. For example, childcare. And so follow-up research shows that in the United States, in Italy, in Spain, in those locations where low-skilled immigrants went, uh, the uh, labor force participation extent, uh, so the amount of work uh, of highly skilled women increased. So what is going on? What is going on is that high-skilled women have been able to outsource some of the household-related tasks like childcare to low-skilled immigrant women. And so um, going back to what um, um, the type of labor market policy reforms that were analyzed by Axel and the fact that we need to make these policy reforms viable, real, um, we see that uh, uh, here, immigration has played a very important role, and actually, I'm going to show you the example of Italy and Spain. Italy is represented by the red bars, and Spain uh, is right next to it. But Italy and Spain have very uh, quite low women labor force participation rates, and they are also the countries where um, it seems that uh, um, immigrants, low-skilled immigrants, have been um, employed um, a lot in household relations tasks. And for these countries, there is evidence about the link that I told you about. So low-skilled um, immigrants leading to higher amount of work by highly skilled women. And um, of course, low-skilled immigrants don't only provide childcare services in the household, they also provide, for example, uh, elderly 
care services, long-term care services. So they supply these services. But of course, population aging is going to affect the demand for these services. The demand for long-term care is going to increase a lot with population aging. And we see that low-skilled immigrants play a very important role by providing these services for which there is not enough supply of native workers. And this is especially true in countries in southern Europe that rely a lot on families, uh, on households, as opposed to public and private institutions to provide long-term care. So again, Italy, Spain, southern European countries. But there is not much empirical evidence about this channel. Next, uh, population aging is going to affect the demand for healthcare services. And again, we see that here high-skilled migrants have provided health care more and more in destination countries, starting from the US, the United Kingdom, but this is increasingly true in the Eurozone area. So for example, in Ireland, almost half of the nurses in Ireland are foreign trained, and more than one-third of the doctors in Ireland are foreign trained. And here you see some summary statistics for countries around the world um, in terms of the fraction of doctors and nurses who are foreign trained. And these fractions are going up. Um, Next, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to switch focus from, um, well, already did, from low-skilled to high-skilled immigrants, and I'm going to talk about research that is growing about the impact of high-skilled immigrants on innovation and productivity. There is um, robust evidence that high-skilled immigrants have increased the level of innovation and patenting activity. This evidence is for the United States, but also for Europe. I'm working myself on data from France, and we are finding, we are confirming the same result. High-skilled immigrants promote patenting activity, innovation. That can take place through many different channels. It might be knowledge flows from countries of origin. It might be selection on observables. So immigrants, a lot of times, at least in the United States, tend to specialize in very technical fields. And it might be mobility across firms that allows knowledge to flow across firms. And it might be task specialization. A lot of time, highly skilled native workers tend to specialize in more uh, administrative CEO type of tasks, while um, um, foreign highly skilled workers tend to specialize in research naturally. And um, so let me show you some statistics for the United States that are quite shocking, I think, in a good way, that show you how much uh, skilled migrants have contributed to innovation um, and uh, productivity in the United States. So in 2000, 47% of uh, um, the STEM workforce with PhDs in the United States uh, was foreign born, and um, a quarter of patents originating between 1990 and 2000 from the United States were, by, were authored by foreigners, and um, um, one quarter of uh, US-based Nobel Prize recipients between 1990 and 2000 were foreign-born. So you can really see that highly skilled migration is an engine of innovation and growth. So let me conclude with a few sparse considerations which are as important. Um, so first of all, the authors talked about the role that FDI can play as a mitigating factor of population aging. And there is now growing evidence about the fact that immigrants promote foreign direct investment. I have myself worked on data on refugees for the United States, resettled refugees, and we do find that, of course, with a certain lag, um, there is um, a, a positive impact of resettled refugees in the United States on foreign direct investment back to the origin countries. Next, um, I want to briefly discuss what Dasman, Fakin, and Signorotto called the floridization of Europe. So the fact that uh, there is this movement from the north uh, to the south of Europe of uh, old age um, individuals. And of course, that is going to have macroeconomic implications in terms of health expenditures, in terms of uh, long-term care expenditures, in terms of inflation. And I think it would be interesting to introduce it in the model. 
And finally, I did not talk about the fiscal impact of migration, which is, of course, related to um, what Axel talked about, because it's usually the aspect of the interaction of population aging and migration that is uh, more often uh, discussed, better known. But I want to make two points about the fiscal impact of migration. The first one is that immigrants not only tend to come in their prime working age, so they're young, not only they have higher fertility rates than natives, but they also, a lot of times, are temporary migrants, especially in Europe. And so they tend to go back to their origin country exactly at the time when they would get pension benefits. So it turns out that a lot of times they contribute to the pension system, but they don't take back from it. And if there are no portability laws between the destination and the origin country. And finally, I want to point out that the fiscal impact of migration varies a lot across studies, across countries. It depends, of course, on the, on the assumptions that we make on participation rates of natives versus migrants and various other assumptions. And I want to show you a graph, which is quite telling. Um, so uh, this is a graph from Italy, and it's from an official a document of the current government, one of the very first documents. So even in a place where migration is very controversial, the uh, role of migration in uh, uh, reducing um, uh, fiscal problems is recognized. So here you have three um, scenarios. The dark green line corresponds to um, uh, actual migration, and it shows you the impact uh, on uh, the debt to GDP ratio. So the debt to GDP ratio would go up in Italy. If uh, migration were reduced by 33%, basically the debt to GDP ratio was, would almost double. While if migration was increased by 33%, the debt to GDP ratio would uh, um, almost, almost stay constant. So I'm going to conclude very quickly. Uh, basically, my point in this discussion was to say that I really enjoyed the paper that I read. Um, I learned a lot. I um, wanted to bring in a discussion about what role migration can play, and the role that migration can play is way more complex than the impact, than the direct impact on the size and age structure of uh, different parts of the population. Many thanks, many thanks, uh, Anna Maria. Um, I will give I will give Axel the opportunity to answer uh, to some of um, the questions and comments made by Anna Maria, and then I will give you the floor here in the in the auditorium. Okay, I'll, I'll be short. Uh, uh, th thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, great discussion. Uh, and I, I fully agree that uh, I, maybe we all, uh, have to study migration more and its complexity and all the feedback cycles uh, which, which are involved. Um, um, <clears throat> just a couple of points. Um, the, the high migration of the order I, uh, uh, I, I draw how to flatten the, the, the aging profile is not only politically infeasible, it's infeasible, period. Uh, so many people won't come. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, the, the fertility effect. Uh, uh, the numbers you showed are the, uh, is the fertility of the incoming natives. Uh, they actually adapt very quickly. So after one generation, you see essentially no fertility differences anymore. So it helps quite right, and it should be modeled. Uh, but uh, the effect is attenuated if you, uh, if you go in the long run. Um, then you have the, uh, I really like that, uh, the nanny effect. Let's call it the nanny effect, uh, that, that you improve uh, labor force participation among high-skilled women. Um, and uh, I, I, I would really like to see a, sort of a quantitative estimate, how, how much that, that. great, yeah. Uh, and uh, now in, in the following points you made, I, I think it's very important to distinguish the indirect effect and the direct effect. Uh, uh, if, if, if we have more people working in long-term care uh, as their primary job, that, that I would call the direct effect, because that's more people, they get a job. Uh, that is actually in the numbers. 
The indirect effects are the interesting one, like the nanny effect, uh, which, uh, which come on top. Uh, or the other one is the, the FDI channel, uh, that it makes FDI easier to, to, to have because you, 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 you can build on the networks which uh, immigrants may, may, may work here. Um, final remark is uh, on high-skilled migration. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, almost all of the high-skilled migration uh, uh, say to Italy or say to Germany or to France is within Eurozone uh, and, uh, uh, migration and very little comes from, from abroad, uh, if I may call outside of the uh, Eurozone abroad. Um, that is somewhat different from, uh, from the situation of the United States, uh, which gets high-skilled uh, migrants uh, from uh, yeah, across the pond. I'm looking at the uh, uh, various MIT graduates sitting here, uh, who uh, m most of them come from elsewhere, right? Um, uh, okay, the, uh, uh, so this, but, but I agree that there, there are more upsides of migration than, I, uh, but there's also down, down uh, size, uh, downwards uh, tendencies. Integration costs are very high, and Germany now, now sees this. Uh, and whether the long run uh, uh, effects really outweigh the, uh, the, the integration costs right now is an open question. Uh, there have been various studies in the US. Uh, uh, some, some are a little bit positive, some are a little bit negative, uh, but it's not as large an effect as uh, you, uh, you want. Uh, just because skilling these uh, new immigrants, especially what has happened in uh, 2015, uh, is, uh, is quite, a, quite a bit of an effort. But anyway, thank you a lot. Uh, very interesting discussion. Well, many thanks uh, to, to Axel and Anna Maria for sure. We, my boss, the watch, you know, tells me six minutes are left. <laughs> I'm already looking, uh, pleading uh, for Christine to give me another five <laughs> minutes. Good, 11 left. But in order for everybody, or not everybody, but at least to have four or five questions, I would ask you, kindly ask you, to keep very short questions and short answers, quick ones. Please. Richard Portis, London Business School. Um, I want to focus on the dependency support ratio story. Um, and uh, the, there are several qualifications I think you have to make to that. Um, the demographers have consistently underestimated the, the rate of increase of life expectancy. We know that. Uh, why won't they continue to? make that mistake, why won't they have continued to make that mistake? Um, and what's more important, healthy life expectancy is going up even faster than life expectancy okay. because of medical advances. So that's one factor that I think uh, changes the picture somewhat. The second factor is that um, you know, endogenous labor supply, there's resistance to working longer, sure, but there are some strong countervailing forces. One is the decline in pension incomes, or if you like, the decline in replacement rate. Um, I think that's very likely, over the, and I think most of the pension predictions say that, um, and that will induce people, induce people to, to work longer. And the second point, and final point, is that is a little more complicated. Um, over the past couple of decades, with relatively stagnant real wages, um, household incomes, the, the rise in household incomes, has been driven by labor, rising labor participation of women. Uh, and there's a limit to that, right? However many nannies you may get in, uh, there's a limit to that, and we're approaching that limit. Uh, now, given that and the rise in mean childbearing age, you're going to have families well, where earners are 65, say, with children 25, 20, 25, um, maybe 30, but still in need of the bank of mom and dad, right? And um, th that will be a further inducement for people to work beyond the age of 65. So I'm very uh, doubtful about the 65-year the limit there. Thank you. Agnès Paris School of Economics. Um, I wanted to connect this excellent session to the first one yesterday about uh, convergence. I was, uh, so Axel showed a uh, wide diversity of aging process across the EU. And I was wondering whether, uh, what, what is the uh, contribution of this diversity in the convergence or lack of convergence of uh, EU countries. Uh, this can go uh, directly through the production function or consumption patterns, but it go, can also go through 
um, uh, the median voter that ages at a different pace across uh, countries. Maybe even the uh, Franco-German divide across the Rhine uh, could partly be due to uh, the di different uh, demographic patterns. So I, I wanted to have your, your views on that. Uh, so accounting, but also uh, the political economy of this. Thanks. Anything? And next to you. Huh? Uh, Daniel Gross, Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. Um, I thought that uh, your presentation missed out one point which is a very important in Europe, which is the upscaling of the skill level of the population. And because we know that higher skilled people have de facto always a much longer working life, and a large part of the increase in the labor force, labor force participation of the elderly, which we have seen over the last years, is due to the fact that the new cohorts coming into that age bracket have a much higher uh, proportion, let's say, of university graduates and others. And I have seen uh, projections which say that that actually will offset the impact of demographic aging. So my question is, if you uh, combine the demographic aging with the increase in the education level of the general population, um, you might get very different results. So one more, Olivier. Uh, these were two tremendous uh, presentations, thank you very much. I was struck by the graph showing the rate of return, the decrease in the rate of return, which I take to be the rate of interest safe, and I assume is determined by global saving and global investment in your model. If this is the case, then everything we discussed in the last two days becomes very relevant, which is that with such rates, uh, the issue of uh, first the cost of debt, but also the zero lower bound, uh, you know, are likely to be with us for a number of years. Okay, and then I have one more at the end. And then I will finish the questions and you, you please have a short sure. answer, yeah. Uh, Charles Goodhart, LSE. Um, unusually, Richard is exactly wrong in his comments. Uh, one, <laughs> of the, one of the main problems of aging uh, which was not mentioned and is going to be enormously increasing is dementia. Dementia is a, an exponential function of age and as the number of aged over the age of 80 increases, the number of care workers will have to increase enormously. There was an FT column that suggested in Japan within 10 years, 10% 10 of the workforce will have to be carers and carers are not likely to have much in the way of productivity increases. Second point is that the increased participation of the elderly has already, over the last 20 years, increased enormously. And it will be increasingly difficult to raise the participation rates of the over 55 by a much greater extent. Now, the questions I have are twofold. Uh, the first one is, surely with the collapse or with the reduction of globalization and the reduction of the a number of young workers, the bargaining power of labor, which has collapsed the, with a continuing decrease in the number of uh, members of private sector trades unions, that the bargaining power of labor will come back with a vengeance. And that will offset the any of the deflationary pressures that you've been mentioning. And my second question, which is primarily at your discussant, is if immigration is so benef economically beneficial, why is it, is it so politically unpopular? <laughs> okay. I won't answer that. So, Axel, would <laughs> you like to start? Yeah, I, and I, I try to be short. Uh, Richard. Uh, we, we all agree that the uh, 65 as a sort of a limit to old age dependency makes no sense. Uh, and, uh, but this is not the driving force here. We actually have uh, in the OLG model, uh, it's a flexible transition. There's no fixed retirement, uh, except in the laws where then it's a bandwidth in how, uh, how people actually decide. 
Now, what we have seen in pensions uh, and the incentive to work longer, uh, that has worked fabulously. So uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, uh, we, we have seen very, very low incentives to work longer and uh, lower labor force participation that changed uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, and since then, we have a rebound of, uh, of labor force participation among people 55 and over. Unfortunately, since 2015, it goes the other way around. Wow. And that is part of the policy backlash which, uh, which uh, I, I, I have tried to model. Uh, so th that may be turned around again, but uh, uh, I have muted optimism that this will, uh, will, uh, will get quick, given the political situation right now. Convergence. Uh, uh, well, I think it goes the other way around and uh, it will strengthen divergence and will uh, not only have a Rhine uh, with, with a bridge, uh, 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 but also the Alps, right? Uh, and it will rather increase uh, and uh, will certainly be part of the uh, EU Commission's work, uh, try to minimize uh, these effects. Um, uh, Daniel, uh, the, uh, the, it's true, if there were an upscaling of the skill level, that could do a lot. Uh, that runs counter the, 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 the current observation of a secular stagnation. Uh, so we have seen the, uh, the, the upscaling of skill levels in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, uh, but if you look at productivity levels, uh, they, uh, they, they seem to go down. But there are all these measurement issues, uh, the big, big, big new debate. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm somewhat muted on that, uh, on, on, uh, on that issue. Um, Olivier, of course. Yeah, the zero bound will be more relevant. Um, and finally, Charles, uh, uh, I, uh, I agree that uh, dementia will be a, a big cost issue. Uh, these models uh, abstract from the healthcare system. If you built in healthcare system and rising costs, uh, so sort of to model a, uh, let me say, American healthcare system as part of the Eurozone, luckily we don't have that, uh, then uh, you, 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 you obviously see much more of a problem. Uh, that has nothing to do with labor supply uh, indirectly, but uh, the, the costs are just skyrocketing of uh, long-term care. Uh, with, with the bargaining of the, uh, of, of the younger generation uh, in, in terms of wages, uh, uh, that is, I would say so, reflected in the increase in wages uh, which you have seen on one of the slides. Anna Maria, would you like to add yes, something? Yes. Hmm? So, um, for long term care, I briefly touched on it. Uh, um, so, long to actually, costs will increase also because of lack of workers who want to provide those services. And that's uh, one of the aspects where low skilled immigration can help. And in terms of the final question, my answer is going to be related to what uh, Gianmarco was talking about in the previous discussion. Uh, just like trade, migration can produce very large benefits, but there are very uneven effects. So um, some groups may uh, gain less or be hurt, uh, and so there needs to be a way to redistribute some of these gains. I uh, should say that the literature on migration actually does not find evidence of these uh, negative uh, labor market effects um, being um, substantial. They're either zero or they're very, very small, and eventually in the medium to long run, they turn positive. So uh, this is the first answer, income distribution effects. The second answer is misinformation. So when you look at survey data, you see that a lot of people don't know, don't have a clue about the number of migrants in their country. And uh, um, so for example, now arrivals to Europe are going down and migration politically is becoming more and more important, which is a paradox. And um, uh, messaging, I think, is very important. Uh, I think in terms of migration, we have been very defensive uh, in trying to uh, rule out negative effects, uh, but we haven't done a good job in uh, um, talking about the positive effects. So a more assertive uh, messaging about migration has, uh, has been done in the past, not now in the United States. Well, um, a little bit 
I, I, I'm so sorry, Jean-Claude. Um, it's not possible. I'm already over my time for at least uh, 10 minutes, I think. And you will not have any lunch, yeah? Um, I'm pretty sure you will, you will have a good discussion over lunch. <laughs> and this afternoon, we had the big topics here at the end. You know, we talked about inequality between the regions. We talked about permanent transfer. We talked about aging and migration. Yeah, and from my point of view, um, we could have another afternoon talking about policy solutions. Yeah, it seems it's the old solutions again. Yeah, it's having a good migration policy. Yeah, uh, put a lot of money into education. Uh, uh, probably a good idea. Yeah, um, and and probably all the other things which were discussed for the last 30 years and sometimes do not happen. Yeah, um, I would like to thank my panelists very much. You know, it was a great session with you. Many thanks. Thank you. <laughs>